we are really happy to be here this morning to tell you about some of the work that we are doing in Africa uh, and uh, in future very soon in Asia. Um, my name is Azadine Downs and I'm the President and CEO of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, uh, headquartered uh, with our International Operations Center on Cape Cod, so we are not far away. Uh, we also have 18 offices around the world, and we're working in 40 countries. And we do uh, a wide variety of things in terms of animal issues, but what we really want to focus on today is the issue of uh, innovation and conservation and how we hope to change the world that I have seen uh, remain quite static for a very, very long time. When you think about conservation and how it started, and some of you may be very familiar with the establishment of national parks and protected spaces uh, around the world, that model really has been in place for about 150 years. And uh, our hope at IFAW is that we are going to begin to change the way that people look at conservation uh, and to end what I like to call fortress conservation. And by fortress conservation, I mean that the animals are inside a protected area and all of the people are outside of that protected area. That model may have worked when there weren't pressures on the protected areas from encroachment uh, by communities, by people, population growth, you know, huge numbers of population growth across Africa and Asia where we work. The notion that the animals are on the inside and the people are on the outside and never the twain shall meet is an idea that I think is dead. And it requires all of us working in the conservation field to begin to think of uh, how we're going to protect animals and how we're going to protect the people that live with wildlife at the same time. And we can't do one without the other, and we're absolutely convinced about that. To give some specifics, uh, today we're gonna talk about mostly elephants. Um, okay. Elephants today are killed every 15 minutes for their ivory. So in the course of the hour that we sit here, at least four elephants somewhere in the world will be killed. This is the statistic. Uh, we have gone historically from a place where there were hundreds of thousands, millions of elephants, to today estimated to be about 350,000 African elephants living across the continent. Right? If you do the math, and you look at the numbers of elephants that are being killed every year, without being able to stop what's happening today, elephant populations across Africa could, could be wiped out within a 10-year period. So it really, really is a crisis. The project that we have come up with to try to stop it, using innovation and using technology, uh, is something that we call uh, TENBOMA. And the reason we came up with it was, was really sort of a stark awakening one day attending a conservation meeting uh, where we had divided ourselves into groups. Stop the killing, so stop the killing of elephants. Stop the trade, which is all about the illegal trade in ivory and how it moves across the world, mostly from Africa to Asia. And then the third group was stop the demand. So the demand for ivory in China. Now, at IFAL, we do all three of those things, right? And I, and I think that that's the correct way to approach it. It's very comprehensive. But what I learned that day was when we divided ourselves as conservationists into those groups, the majority of people went to stop the demand and stop the trade and there were maybe three or four of us sitting at Stop the Killing. And it really struck me that the, the whole goal of our work is to prevent the killing of these elephants in the first place. It is not to allow the killing and then chase down the bad guys. 
So we were guilty of that as well in the sense that we were working with uh, police agencies around the world, trade agencies around the world, to intercept a product. And that product was ivory. And we began to realize that we had made a mistake, that we were chasing a product, and we were trying to interdict a product, as opposed to the real goal was to prevent the killing of the elephants in the first place. And so it's a, a, a shift that I want you to try to think about. Because what you'll find in the news is, what are the Chinese doing with ivory? What is the cost of ivory? Uh, does burning ivory drive up the cost? Does it decrease the cost? And it's always about the economics. But end of the day, the goal was to stop the killing of the elephants in the first place. The shift came when uh, I met Faye and a number of other colleagues who were coming from a military background and began to tell us about the work that they had done in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and particularly focused on the issue of the improvised explosive devices. Now, we all know that from the news. These were you know, bombs, roadside bombs, and trying to get ahead of that, uh, that terrorist tactic, if you will, uh, they also realize that we have to stop allowing the bombs go off and then simply chasing the bad guys. The damage is done. So we began to think in a timeline, Faye and her colleagues would talk about left of the boom, left of the explosion. You look on a timeline. You want to stay on the, the side of the, the explosion before it happens. And we began to think about, well, how could we do that? How could we get left of the kill and begin to think about how we could prevent poachers from striking in the first place? Um, so that, that really is sort of the genesis of uh, Tenboma. The name comes from uh, a Kenyan initiative uh, after the Westgate Mall bombing. And that was also uh, big news, the connection between Al-Shabaab terrorist groups right, infiltrating Kenya blew up and killed a large number of people at the Westgate Mall. And the Kenyan security services instituted a program which they called in Swahili uh, Nyumakumbi, which means 10 houses. And it basically is like if you see something, say something. The notion of every 10 houses, neighbors should know who their neighbors are. And if anyone is infiltrating from the outside, they should report that. And we came up with the concept that could we do that in a rural setting? Uh, and call it ten boma, boma being the enclosure right, for the animals. People also live in bomas. And so uh, the, the, the transfer of that concept worked very well for people who were living with wildlife and who saw the boma as their safe place. Right? So, th so that's, that's where the name ten boma uh, comes from. The idea and the shift towards uh, a predictive model. How could we figure out how to predict where poachers were going to hit? And what technologies could we use that would help us do that? And you know, there are many, many groups who um, are using various technologies and uh, a lot of competition. You know, even in the world of conservation, there are groups who are very competitive, and I won't say that we're not competitive because we believe we're bringing a, a unique perspective, but the fact of the matter is that uh, many, many groups launching initiatives to stop the killing of elephants uh, using technology were competing with one another. And I thought, well, where is all the data going? W what are people doing with all of that information? And again, talking to Faye and her colleagues, and uh, being invited to, to speak with members of the intelligence community uh, in uh, Washington from the US side, but also in Kenya, uh, in very unusual ways, again, for a conservation group to have that type of access, we began to realize that the, the wave, the tsunami of information and data was simply just sitting there. And it wasn't being analyzed in a way that would then go back and people could deploy to 
act on it, and again, anticipate where poachers would strike. Um, so not only is this innovative from a technology point of view, again, it's, it's shifting uh, the scene in the conservation world so that groups like ourselves actually cooperate in ways that they've never cooperated before. Uh, and it's vital in this particular sense because we need the data to be large enough, the data set to be large enough so that patterns emerge and then we can predict. If we're not able to do that, we're simply collecting data, and, and Faye is going to talk about that. So, so that's the, the really the concept um, of, of Ten Boma. Uh, the other concept, and then I'm going to show you a, a, a short film, um, is what is it that we do with all of that data? And how do we map it? So we began talking about geospatial mapping, uh, how could we layer things on? When you look at incursions by terrorist groups such as Al-Shabaab uh, coming in from Somalia into Kenya, they will often insert themselves into um, you know, herdsmen driving cattle, right? And they have uh, reasons and excuses why they need to come in, either it's water or it's some other need. And so we began to think, well, let's map out layer upon layer upon layer of what is actually happening and begin to think in ways that um, tip, a typical conservation group would not think about, like why is there petty crime uh, shortly before there's a poaching incident? And we always use the example of um, three or four days before there's a poaching incident, there always seems to be a rash of theft from small shops and they're stealing tea and sugar. So why would anyone report that? Why would it make its way uh, to intelligence services or uh, you know, police services, uh, law enforcement? It's because those are poachers stealing those goods that they need to survive out in the bush whilst they poach. Seems like a petty crime. If you begin to map it, the pattern emerges. And so those are the types of things that we're talking about. Um, we also have concepts of how we can get people involved using technology, uh, but there are pros and cons, and it's something, you know, as I said, we're hoping that, you know, you have questions at the end. Crowdsourcing of information. Uh, there are examples of this being done in Africa, uh, but it's also very dangerous. You know, are you asking community members to send texts, to send alerts? Are they coded? Are they, are, you know, are those... Um, telephone calls being intercepted uh, sometimes. And we know from other parts of Africa that in fact people have lost their lives because they've participated in a, in a crowdsourcing uh, exercise. And so we keep these things in mind because obviously we're here to save the lives of elephants, but we don't want the technology to also cause the loss of life in the communities, all right? So those are some of the things to think about. That's sort of the genesis of the Ten Boma uh, project. And I'm now going to uh, show a short video. You know, it's simple, really. Poaching, illegal wildlife trade, it's run by organized criminal networks. It's the same groups running drugs, trafficking in weapons, in humans, in conflict minerals. I supported counter-terror operations for the last 15 years. Getting inside these people's heads to understand really how they think. That's how you get ahead of it. If there's one thing that I can tell you about poachers, wildlife dealers, it's that they're criminals and they can be stopped. Poaching is an epidemic. An elephant is killed for its ivory every 15 minutes. These rangers risk their lives to protect elephants. 
when the issue of poaching was explained to me, it sounded very similar to how terror networks and insurgent networks operate. This radical new approach brings battle-tested military tactics into the fight to save wildlife. The same methods used to destroy terror networks are now being used to connect all the dots of information, giving authorities an enhanced picture of poaching activities. Key to our strategy is forming strong ties within the local communities. There will actually be an extra pair of eyes and ears so that they can provide security for wildlife. Because tips from locals can warn us when criminals enter the area. This grassroots intelligence is our strongest weapon. But the idea is to combine this with much bigger data. Software and hardware developed for elite military units organizes information from communities, rangers, police, Interpol, other NGOs, satellite data, and many other sources. Analysts deliver reports right into the hands of field officers who can stay one step ahead of poaching networks. With the 10 bomber, then I tell you, no individual, no suspect will get his way free. And his days will be numbered. Kenya is a country that has consistently demonstrated its commitment to protecting elephants and other wildlife. With a strategic influx of funding, we can revolutionize KWS enforcement technology and procedures, saving elephants and stopping the poachers before they kill. It is a heritage for the world. It's not only for Kenya. We conserve for the people of the world. I'm going to turn it over to Faye in a, in a second. The last thing I'd just like to leave you with um, is that we really are at the tipping point in protecting wildlife around the world. Um, traditional conservation has really looked at the numbers. You know, what is the size of the population? And if the population was large enough, um, it was considered healthy, and conservation groups considered themselves doing a good job. Um, at IFA, we believe in the importance of individual animals and the role that they play. And the reason I bring this up is because in that operation uh, clip that you just saw, the, the elephants and other wildlife are spending 80% of their time outside of protected areas. In a size, an operation size, uh, which is considered small, is the size of Ireland. So when you think, well, why can't you patrol the fence? Why can't you use drones? Uh, why can't you just get more rangers with guns? These animals exist on community lands. And we have to take into consideration what the community thinks about it, what they are getting, how they are staying safe, um, and the more that they can learn about the individual uh, animals uh, and their behaviors, the safer they can be. And so we have taken an approach that combines uh, the technology, innovations in it, um, but also involving communities. And, and it's our belief that if we don't involve communities uh, meaningfully, then we will not succeed in our job. So, the, the world of conservation can no longer be divided into the animals are on the inside and the people are on the outside. It just is not possible in today's world. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Faye, who will give you uh, an incredible overview and, 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 and also talk about the importance of communities from the perspective of Temboma. So thank you. Thank you, Azdeen. I'm going to sit here if everybody can hear me okay, mostly just because my shoes are uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's see. So I'm going to advance a couple of slides here. Thank you, Azadine. Azadine um, did a great job of highlighting the, the scope of the challenge that we're faced with in Africa with respect to the rate of extinction, the pace of extinction that elephants are, are on a path toward. Um, he mentioned an elephant dies uh, at the hands of a poacher about every 15 minutes. That translates to about 26,000 elephants a year. The population of savanna elephants in Africa that is about at just 350,000. So when I met Azadine, was introduced in uh, 2013, late 2013, it was really the height of the current poaching crisis. And the center of gravity for that poaching crisis was in Kenya. And I'm going to try to talk through this pretty quickly because it would be great to have some time for, for Q&A. Um, I am, uh, as, as Azadine mentioned, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. I've spent about 17 years with Special Operations Command. And so the foundation of TENFOMA really does uh, derive from counter-terror and counter-insurgency strategy. Now, as a military staff officer, to look at an opportunity um, to have impact against poaching and wildlife crime networks through a TENBOMA, it was also an opportunity to perhaps fill some gaps and shortfalls in that counter-insurgency strategy because NGOs, uh, uh, wildlife conservation organizations like IFA, you know, we have opportunity and we do take long views toward these problems toward these challenges. It's not um, a one-year deployment. It is we're there to work with these communities and to save these wi save wildlife from the brink of extinction. And as Azadine mentioned, um, with respect to, to elephants, um, in Africa there are 37 countries that are home to elephants. And elephants are a migratory species. They can, herds of elephants can move um, maybe 75 to 100 kilometers a day. Uh, in search of water and, and forage. And 80% of the time, they're outside of the parks. So for us, working and, and partnering and engaging with communities is a critical core tenet of TENFOMA. Now, in the work that we do with communities, they face social challenges uh, in these areas in much the same way that we, that we face them here in the US. Um, it is oftentimes that these communities that buffer areas around the parks uh, fall, you know, they fall below the poverty line. Um, impacts of climate change and extreme drought are readily apparent in these areas and are really impacting ways of life, ways, livelihoods and ways of life that these communities have, have enjoyed and, and um, uh, their ways of life that they have, you know, uh, enjoyed for, for millennia. Um, we see pastoral cattle herding populations or communities now doing more with small-scale agriculture um, because it's dif difficult to maintain herd size and keep cattle healthy um, when facing extreme drought, which is where we are right now in Kenya. Uh, they're, they're also typically undergoverned spaces. Uh, for instance, one of IFA's core landscapes in Kenya, the Amboseli Greater Kilimanjaro landscape, sits in an undergoverned space of Kenya uh, next or adjacent to a very porous border with Tanzania. And that causes challenges for people and for wildlife. And so the solutions that we look to drive with TENBOMA really are to find, you know, again, solutions that are beneficial for both people and, and wildlife. And that needs to be innovative. I think we have one more video, really just, I think it's a couple of seconds, but just to show, you know, how we want to be able to tap into the community. Or maybe it doesn't. Am I, uh, do I have to do anything to? Ten Boma oh, is based on an existing uh, community security philosophy. If ten houses can look out for each other, then the, the larger community becomes safer as a result. Ten Boma takes that philosophy and we move that out into the landscapes, to these communities that reside in Bomas, which sit just outside the protected areas. If we can link ten Bomas, then we've just built a safety buffer around these national parks, which extends the breadth and width of it. You know, the innovative aspect of that is it really it's, it's taking an existing East African community security philosophy and it's aligning it to U.S. and coalition counter-terror strategy to really create a network, a safety buffer for wildlife in, in and around these protected areas. You know, so now the question becomes, or for this group, you know, what's next? The good news is that we have achieved success with this model in Kenya and cross-border into Tanzania. We saw a uh, Savo conservation area in Kenya, which is home to Kenya's, it's Kenya's largest national park, 
It's home to its largest, largest elephant population. There are currently <coughs> about 13,500 elephants in, um, in, Sabo, in the Savos. Uh, so what's next? And you know, how do we scale those successes that we've seen in the Savos uh, beyond, across borders, and to those 37 other countries in Africa that are home to elephants? And that's not military strategy, that's partnerships with the for-profit sector. Um, I had the opportunity to work with a pretty crack uh, MBA graduate intern this summer from Boston University who's with us today, and we had lots of conversations because I, where I see this challenge through the lens of a military intelligence officer, Jen, who's here, uh, saw it through the lens of an MBA student and we came up with some, we had some pretty interesting conversations between Nairobi and um, Savo and Ambicelli on this topic. But you know, to really scale those successes requires resources. And it's the current traditional funding mechanisms that power uh, conservation don't necessarily lend themselves to that kind of scale. You know, it was yesterday that former Secretary Kerry um, said in one of his, in his presentation that the future of diplomacy is community engagement and collaborations. That's gonna drive the change with respect to climate change and pollution and other environmental certainties that we need to see. And I would offer that it's the same in the conservation space, that it's partnerships and community engagement, um, and collaboration that's gonna drive the change we need at the pace that we need to see it. And that's where the for-profit and, and NGO partnerships become key. So what does that mean? <coughs> I think it means in, in one respect that it requires us to develop collectively a new narrative to determine how we intersect these new market possibilities beyond you know, what for the wildlife conservation space has, has traditionally been tourism and the direct monetization or valuation of wildlife in these nature-based economies with respect to tourism. You know, so to this group, you know, what, what does add to that narrative? What, what are those new market possibilities? This is a gratuitous image of zebras. <laughs> but <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> but uh, what, one thing I did wanna highlight is when we talk about communities and we talk about challenges, sometimes those challenges come from the proximity of these communities to wildlife. So where you see these four beautiful zebras in the front of the frame, you'll see a herd of cattle, just as beautiful, uh, toward the back of the frame. Um, these are uh, cattle that belong to a pastoral community. You'll see some of the herders there. You'll see a safari uh, vehicle on the road just beyond. Uh, so you see that these are, are uh, you know, they're, they're small spaces. And oftentimes, land use and human population growth can have the effect of making those spaces even smaller. So what do we do? You know, is there an opportunity to drive change at a faster pace that can scale beyond local and linear impacts? And we think that there is, and we think that requires getting just a little bit disruptive, disruptive within the context of what IFA calls our Ten Boma project. And really the, the philosophy behind what we call disruptive is bottom, bottom, bottoms up, not bottoms up, I've been corrected on that a couple times, <laughs> bottom up and beyond, bottom up in that it's not a fortress conservation model that's descending on a conservation area. It's an organization that's coming in and based on the relationships and trust that they've established with communities and with wildlife service, we're gonna build that model from the bottom up so that it truly answers the, uh, the challenges that communities are facing, oftentimes those social challenges, um, in a way, again, that is both beneficial for people and for wildlife. Now, the beyond part comes because we have to look beyond those traditional funding models to do that. Um, it, it is the reality that oftentimes uh, traditional funding pots for conservation means that it's short-term projects and that it's partnership on paper only, that we're not driving the integration and, and the cohesive collaboration that we really uh, need to in order to scale this and have the impact that we want to have on a global and exponential level. 
So that really, for us, from a conservation perspective, you know, oftentimes, you know, as Professor Porter has said as well, oftentimes businesses were viewed to be the problem. They were the causes of pollution. They were ca the causes of, of some of these spaces getting smaller for wildlife. And for us, this drives, you know, a new view, a new optic in how we view collaboration and the value that we see in, um, in partnering with the for-profit sector. Disruptive is bottom up and beyond. Another aspect of our work, and this is coming from a wildlife conservation organization, and we see it every day, is the fact that we need to empower women. I read a, a quote from Melinda Gates yesterday on my Facebook page, because that's, that's what we're like, we're like Facebook. Um, <laughs> But what Very she close. said on the, yeah, close, like yeah. this. <laughs> on the International Day of the Girl, Melinda said that women are drivers of progress, creators of wealth, and the world's greatest force for transforming societies. And of course, I couldn't agree more. So within these communities that we work with, there's an opportunity for us as wildlife conservationists to empower women to have a voice not only in conservation, but in land management and in their own, um, in their own empowerment. And you know, we have, again, opportunities to look to, are there, you know, can we bring more opportunities for STEM education to uh, tribal cultures like Maasai and Samburu and some of these um, traditional cultures that are in East Africa? Because there's a want and a desire and an aptitude there from STEM education to computing, to using technology to solve challenges in their community from um, early pregnancy and other female social issues to uh, land management and ownership and coexistence with and security um, within those communities. And that takes investment. So again, to this group, what are, what are those opportunities? Is impact investing an opportunity for wildlife conservationists? Is that a nexus point where we can come together to achieve that shared value that Professor Porter talks about? Um, is it, you know, as a wildlife conservation organization, can we, you know, work to empower those communities to enable that talent and those skills that exist in these areas through through impact investing that goes beyond just um, sustainable supply chains, but actually creating simultaneous shared value on, on all sides. <clears throat> now, as he talked a little bit about this, you know, we do use a good bit of technology uh, within Tenboma, but I think where the Tenboma project, NIFA, differs itself or differenti differentiates itself from other conservation projects is that we haven't lost sight of innovation. For us, it's not just about developing tech, it's not just about fielding tech, but it's to take it that one step further to ensure that we're achieving end user adoption because tech can do a lot, but if it sits on a shelf because a user hasn't understood its application or how it can integrate into their existing workflow, then the tech didn't do its job. Um, so for us, it's, it's all about innovation. We, and we do that largely through local developers, uh, in Kenya and East Africa through universities and through um, other commercial technology developers with that same goal in mind, always how, how are we creating shared value. And for those folks to have a, a real world challenge that impacts them on a daily basis um, and to be able to achieve some technical uh, results toward having impact and driving poaching numbers down and securing wildlife, it's been a fantastic collaboration. This is just the last slide, which leaves some, some time for questions and answers. But again, you know, in the, in the conservation space, particularly over the last couple of years with respect to wildlife security, we often hear that you know, this piece of technology, this software application, this new approach, this new uh, NGO, it's going to be the game changer. This app, it's the game changer. This project, it's the game changer. And what I would challenge this group to look at is we don't have time for game changers. It's, time to bring all of those game changers together in a cohesive and collaborative environment because it's time now to game the change. It's time now to get ahead of those poaching numbers um, so that we're not the generation that lost the elephants. Thank you. Yeah, so we would love to uh, Add, uh, answer any questions you might have or, or take suggestions as to you know, what you're thinking about in terms of technology and conservation or uh, just general comments.
Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so the question is, uh, if the community has an economic interest in the poaching and the, you know, the monetary proceeds from the poaching, how is it that you can work with them to, to stop that? Uh, a couple of things, and then, you know, Faye, jump in. I think early on in the fight against poaching, there was, the, the conventional wisdom was uh, poaching is driven by poverty. And it's driven by the poverty of the, of the local people. What we've learned over the last 10 years is that, by and large, it's not true. That is not true. Uh, not to say that it doesn't play a role, but it is not the, the driver. When you talk to law enforcement officials, and we have, a, we have an agreement with Interpol, uh, and so we work with them very closely to look at how the product goes from you know, that scene that you saw all the way uh, typically to Asia, it's, it's a network that is being driven by large-scale organized crime. The, the, the people on this end, not all that much money involved. Um, not to say that they wouldn't take what they can get, but it's not the economic driver that we once thought it was. And so that, that changes the equation in that you can appeal to communities in ways that we perhaps wouldn't have before. So in IFO's case, we offer scholarships. Um, we, we work with them to bring in clean water. We work with them to bring in uh, health services. So some, you know, the criticism of that is, why is a conservation group doing that? But the fact of the matter is, if you can show the community that there is economic benefit into protecting the wildlife, you can win them over. And I think that you know, from a colonial and post-colonial framework, most of these communities have been lied to for decades, that they would somehow benefit from, from the wildlife. And by and large, they haven't. Um, there, there was a, a woman, again, to the point that Faye was talking about, uh, in Semburu uh, in the north. And they formed a collective uh, and a conservancy so that they could bring tourism, right? And the woman, I, I said, well, why are you doing this? And she said, I always thought growing up that wildlife belonged to white people. And now I realize that we need to go back to what we, th we believed before. And, and that is a powerful thing to, to be staring, you know, in the face. Um, and the notion that there are no other alternatives we found is not to be true. Thank you. I live in Africa and I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, and, and this program of, uh, of Ten Boma is, is a very good approach. I've always believed that if the communities don't get some form of benefit from conservation, it's not going to work. And I wanted to ask the question that, if, if I just look at that one diagram that you showed, now you got these people or the communities around Savu, um, do they not feel in some way that their grazing amount will be inflicted on with wildlife and therefore the carrying capacity of their own domestic stock will decline? And how does one compensate for that? Uh, uh, you know, one, one should maybe just expand a bit on the plan. You, you can't continue to just reward them monetarily for not killing an elephant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a difficult one. I'd like to know what your ideas is about that. Thank you. Sure. And where do you live in Africa? Yes. Uh, sorry? Where do you live in Africa? South Africa. In South Africa? 
Well, we're not quite neighbors yet. I live in Nairobi. <laughs> I just moved there with my family in April um, because it felt to, like... To Kenya. Mm -hmm, to Kenya. Great. Yeah. It felt like there was opportunity to drive even more change um, if I could do it from, from on the ground. What I quickly found out, what I, or what I quickly learned when I got to Kenya, a couple things. One, I think first and foremost, and we talked about it during the comments, is that the talent is there and that the solutions are there. Um, but on occasion, there might be some, you know, some need for assistance or for enabling to, to really achieve, um, to achieve the results that we need to. And the second thing is that you, it's impossible to divorce the issue of domestic livestock management from wildlife security. And that really you know, becomes part of what we work with these communities to, to do. I think to, to your question too, you know, it's interesting when you work, as we've had the benefit to be able to do when you work with Maasai and, and some of these other pastoral communities, there really is a sense of community before there's a sense of individual. And so I think that's one of the opportunities we have, you know, to really ostracize what the, the individuals within community, because it's an aberration. The Maasai have lived in, in peaceful coexistence with wildlife for millennia. So now, you know, the challenge that they face is that it is the drivers of climate change and uh, population growth that have had impacts on their traditional pastoral um, livelihood, which is, you know, the cattle aren't as healthy as they used to be and herd sizes um, that have been traditional in the hundreds are more difficult to manage. We have some of, some of the Maasai from Amboseli are coming to Nairobi for, for grass. Um, you know, as the droughts get more severe, it's more and more difficult to manage. Pushes some of them into more of the, the agricultural, um, uh, agri agricultural work, which is difficult because that's, that can be incompatible land use in, in these elephant ranges. So it's really, it's a continuous dialogue. You know, next week, um, we have an opportunity to take some female uh, conservancy owners from the Amboseli Greater Kilimanjaro landscape up to meet with other female conservancy landowners in Maasai Mara. To have one, a, a female only cross-cultural exchange, we've done the same for males, um, but now it's an opportunity for female landowners to have their own uh, exchange, but it's to discuss those very same issues. And again, how from bottom up um, can we start to build strategies that maybe you know, there's opportunities to have dialogue about reducing herd size uh, and then opening up space to grow grass to help communities get through more extreme drought conditions. And then maybe there's an opportunity to work with others to technically enable some of those. But no, that's a great question. Thank yeah, you. I mean, definitely, you know, what we like to say is if we don't solve the range management issue for cattle, we're not, go we're not going to be able to save the elephants because that, that there, is a, there is an incredible uh, butting of heads there, but you know, seeing some some positive signs, including the use of technology um, to to manage grasslands, and, so, and in small areas, I think in, in the Mara, um, we're seeing some success there, where they're showing that they can, uh, you know, through various techniques, grow the grass long enough uh, and in large enough areas to to sustain the herds, but at the same time. You know, I mean, I think you know, trying to get, trying to convince them to reduce the herd size is a, is a tough one. Yeah, it's tough. I, I can maybe Jen. just, just two words say that the, the community responsibility for conservation, once they feel some benefit, yeah. it really works. Um, yeah. I've been working in wildlife my whole career. Yeah. And we moved elephants uh, from South Africa to Northern Angola at one point. Yeah. Uh, because the entire elephant population in that region was decimated due to the civil war. Yeah. And we airlifted elephants into an area, protected them, trained the local people to look after these elephants. And that was in the year 2003. Okay. We took 34 elephants. Oh. Today, we got 134. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They increased and we never lost one because yeah. the people took ownership of the project. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's yeah. great to hear. Thank yeah. you. I'll stop talking. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would say that there is good news. Uh, we have a very large office in China. Uh, we've been there for over 20 years now. Uh, we do a lot of um, public awareness to get people to understand what is it that happens when um, they have a piece of ivory in their hand and where did it come from. So the polling showed, unbelievably or not, uh, that 80% of Chinese people polled believed that um, ivory came from the tooth falling out. Because in Chinese, uh, the tusk is the word for tooth. So they thought, you know, like a baby tooth, it fell out. Once they learned through a course of public awareness campaigns that the elephant uh, was killed for the ivory, the number of people who said they would buy ivory dropped from 80% polled to about 54% in the time period that we were looking at. Um, so that's, that's good news. There are more Chinese uh, tourists going to Africa than ever before. Uh, that comes with a risk because they're moving small pieces of ivory as well. So we have, uh, we have an initiative to um, let people know in, in, in Mandarin Chinese uh, what they can and they cannot do. We have a Mandarin speaking Kenyan on our staff in Kenya reaching out to the larger community. And so one of the things I just, I just want to say, because uh, this is what makes it into the press all the time, uh, about destruction of ivory, right? Now, the Chinese have agreed that they're going to close down domestic markets. Uh, we're still waiting for the actual you know, hammer to fall. But that is an extraordinary decision. And the, the notion of ivory having no value is something that we have put out there that as long as, ivory, as long as elephants are being killed for the ivory, we would never support any sort of economic trade in ivory. We've participated, the United States has burned uh, you know, tons of ivory. Um, other governments around the world said that they would never, ever do that. The Chinese immediately burned 1.1 tons, you know, over a one ton by the, <laughs> of the US, to, yeah, to say, you know, we beat you. Uh, so that's fine with us. Uh, but all of the economists, and you will see, you know, in every you know, Wall Street Journal and The Economist and uh, Daniel Stiles and others who will say, you are driving up the price of ivory because you're making it more valuable. You're reducing the supply. So supply and demand 101, it simply is not the dynamic at play. We've seen the prices of ivory crash in Hong Kong. But Faye was telling me last night that the price on the ground is not changing. So that's a dynamic that we still have to try to figure out what's, what's happening. No, no, yeah. Well, that's what we're asking you all to do. So take everyone to dinner. Yeah. 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 Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Awesome. We'd love to have you. Yeah. You know, really, for us, what I. It really is, it's a partnership, right? It's not that the tech sector can come in and have, or if you, to ask me, you know, it's difficult for the tech sector to come in, not partner with the conservation community and have impact that we'd like to see. Because what, you know, what we can share is, you know, we understand how, how technology is currently being used and what we'd like to see it achieve. And then from there, we haven't even thought about, well, I mean, we think about it, but you know, what, what can AI and data science bring to this? As Dean and I were speaking a little bit about this last night, and there's incredible opportunity there. Yeah. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I, you know, again, it's just an idea, but if you, if you think of the work that Cynthia Moss has done in Amboseli, the longest running scientific project uh, on elephants, 40 years, it's not even the lifetime of one elephant, right? Now, 
they have people who know all of those elephants by sight. And if you take what I was saying at the very beginning is that you know, individual animals do matter. They have different personalities. They act in different ways. Uh, some are crop raiders, some have killed, some know how to break fences. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to get people to understand uh, more about how elephants respond to their own actions. And they all have, they all have smartphones. I mean, you know, you guys, you guys have the, the, the Maasai kilt on and somehow they're reaching in there and out comes a phone. So, you know, uh, um, could there be facial recognition? You know, who is that elephant? And if there's a track record, for example, of, yeah, that elephant causes a lot of trouble, but it's never hurt anyone, it's never, never broken a fence, it's never broken a, a hut, could they use that to know, okay, well, let's use the firecrackers, or let's all shout, or let's retreat? I mean, there was a man killed last week, you know, trying to keep the elephant from raiding crops, and, and he's killed. And I think that there are ways to use technology uh, to sort of leapfrog in Africa. I mean, some of the things you see, they're, they're, they're stretching wires out here, and I'm thinking, wh why? I mean, why, don't, why isn't it all solar? Why couldn't there be solar-powered motion detectors for early alert systems? And how do the people get that alert? So there's all sorts of things that could happen. You know, we internally don't have the expertise, but we know that it needs to be done. And so I think that is an opportunity. You know, we were sort of brainstorming last night, particularly here in Boston, you know, Cambridge, and this, this, this community, is to sit down and say, listen, let us tell you every problem we have, right? And you tell us. Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the um, w yeah, they said that so many of the images were of Maasai, um, you know, are they key to, to the success of the project? I think we launched, we launched in the Maasai area of Kenya. Uh, you know, as Faye was talking about, we hope to be able to, to scale it up. Um, we also, you know, we also found some, I, I think, really courageous leadership. Um, even within the larger Maasai community, and we didn't have time to talk about this, but uh, in the area of operations where there's a corridor that goes from Mbaseli National Park down to the border with Tanzania, there's a migratory corridor. There's also another one that goes through Maasai land uh, to the east, to Chulos and, this, and Savo. Now, one Maasai leader chooses to put that corridor into conservation. The other Maasai group leader decided to sell. And, you know, as Faye was saying, one is now a corridor for movement, the other now is a crime corridor. And what were the statistics? Like 80 to 90 uh, wildlife human conflict incidents per month in the area where the Maasai leader decided to sell the land. So, it, you know, as we were saying, it really does depend on um, the communities themselves being involved. Otherwise, you're just imposing. And, uh, and politically and economically, uh, people wind up losing their lives. And, and so do the elephants. They, they, killed the, they killed the elephant who actually killed the man. So um, that's why you see so many images of Maasai. But you know, we are hoping that we can scale it up. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we have a couple of different apps that we use within Tenboma, and one, um, well, uh, and there are a couple of different varieties. We have a couple of different apps that serve what we call a Jicho function. Jicho in Swahili just means eyes. So they're mobile mapping apps, but what's important for the wildlife service rangers and the, for the community rangers is just to understand that these are, these are your eyes. So when you're out and you make observations, that we want to be able to digitally record those using your Jicho app. Um, 
So USAID has a version, well, they're, by name it's called WILD, um, and it serves a JICHO function within Tenboma, and it's developed by Strathmore University in Nairobi. But it's the opportunity that we have, again, because we'd like to keep that R&D cycle tight in Tenboma, which is why it's so palatable to be able to work with local developers, is that if there's a customization or an upgrade or you know, a workflow diversion that's required, we can get it to the developer and then it get, get it back out into the field in the, in the shortest time possible. Uh, so Wild is an example of how we do that with Strathmore, and it's been uh, incredibly effective. In fact, we have what we call mobile training teams with Tenboma, so when we go around these areas and train com either community rangers or wildlife service rangers, we'll typically bring a developer from Strathmore with us so she can hear the, he or she can hear the, uh, hear the feedback from the rangers and how they're using it, what functionality they're not using, and then, yeah, they'll turn that back into the next, uh, to the next update. Um, and then we have a second app that we use in our uh, wildlife forensic crime scene investigation for first responders role. So it's a six step software application that sits on the same Android device that the Jicho app does. Um, but because we were so often losing uh, wildlife crime cases at prosecution because the evidence collected at the crime scene was no good, uh, particularly the biological evidence, we've created a, an app, paired it with some forensic evidence kits that allow rangers in the first responder role to use the app to walk through how to manage, contain a crime scene and then collect biological samples from it. But that was developed by, in partnership with a, um, a commercial software developer in Kenya. And again, same, same model. We drag them out when we employ it and do training so they can hear the feedback from the end user. How are we for time? I see, I think we're way over, but people are, there's hordes at the door. They can come in. They want to. They're going to do it again. <laughs> Is anyone in charge? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, you know, because we, we talked about demand reduction, we talked about communities, we talked about poaching, um, because I think it, what all that culminates, or the fact that that culminates around, is that this is a globally organized criminal network, from the poacher to the end purchaser in, in China. And again, how do we know that? Because you can't, we, we see confiscations for ivory in Singapore, in China, in Malaysia, in you Dubai, name it, yeah. but you cannot, move ivory from, and, and they're African elephants by DNA forensic analysis. It's been determined that their that tusk comes from uh, elephants in, uh, among African populations and you cannot move ivory on a global scale unless you have glo globally organized criminal networks involved um, in, in the movement. So for instance, in the Savos last year, we talked about our local successes uh, and we did. We, we drove a 43% reduction in poaching in the Savos. Um, from one year to the next, and as uh, Janet mentioned, in some of our surge locations, again, taking that from the counter-terror context, where we surge resources, we drove poaching in traditional hot spots, um, which were measured over a six-year trend, we drove it down to zero, and that trend continues. Yeah, so that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. But to your point, then what happens next, right? And we use the, uh, the analogy of a partially inflated balloon. So where we squeeze in one place, like we squeezed in those surge locations, the air necessarily needs to go somewhere. And crime networks work the same way. So we drove poaching down by 43%. We didn't drive it down to zero. But we did see, you know, get geeky, but we did see temporal and spatial displacement in where poaching was happening. So in other words, where it was happening more overtly in areas outside the park, we did push poaching based on spatial analysis to areas that were the most difficult to poach in. And the temporal shift indicates that the poachers understand what, uh, in this case, the Kenya Wildlife Service, what their response capabilities are. Because we saw poaching happen where we, the temporal trends previously had been, we saw it kind of start to uptick ahead of long and short rains. Um, for last year, we didn't see it happen until after the short, or until after the rains. 
In other words, these are now areas that are incredibly marshy, where roads are washed out. And poachers leverage that because they know KWS doesn't have the responsibility to get to these locations. So that's where we saw poaching happen. And I think one of the, uh, just one other interesting statistic from a counter-terror perspective, um, last year we also saw a shift in weapon used to poach elephants in the Sabos. So where poaching by firearm had been the weapon of choice by poachers, last year 70% of elephants poached in the Sabos were poached by poison arrow. So the, the bad news is that it's a horrible death for elephants to die by poison arrow. It literally stops their heart from beating. From a counterinsurgency and law enforcement perspective, though, it is indicative that your enforcement capacity, that your enforcement techniques are working because you forced that shift in tactic. There's also an incredible ethical question um, embedded in what you're talking about because if you look at wildlife crime, $20 billion a year industry, third after uh, arms and drugs, right? So what I was talking about in the very beginning, when you go after a product and you push it you know, into another area, you're always chasing that product. If you go after the network, it's the same networks. So the question we get sometimes from an ethical point of view is, uh, aren't you just encouraging you know, criminal networks to do something else, whether it's drugs, cigarettes, pharmaceuticals, sex slaves, and you say, well, we can't take all that on, but if we can disrupt the networks, we will also have a dent in them.